Okay, so welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Tracy Weisgerber and I am a physiologist by training, but now a meta science working at meta scientist working at the Quest Center for Responsible Research. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this seminar series and thank you for joining. The goal of this seminar series is to create a lasting resource for the community to talk about different methods in meta science that one might use for science of science or research on research studies and to explore some of the challenges and pitfalls that one might encounter when using those methods as well as positive examples of interesting and methodologically sound studies. So today I'm going to talk about some of our work, which uses a literature survey style of systematic review. So as we start, I think it's important to talk about what is a systematic review and how it differs from the narrative reviews that most of us are used to seeing in the scientific literature. So when we have a traditional or narrative review, the author is going to write about papers that they know about and they think are important. Important. And this is different from a systematic review because with a systematic review, there is a very standardized process that we use to systematically identify and evaluate all literature that has addressed or answered a particular research question. So with the narrative review or the conventional review, there's no real procedure that's used for identifying articles. It's simply up to the scientist who's writing the review or the researcher to decide what they want to include and why. Whereas when we do a systematic review, we would go through an extensive search procedure where we are using at least two search engines and we have very clearly defined inclusion and exclusion criteria for what types of articles we want to include and why. Um, in terms of assessing those included articles, again, with the narrative review, there are no specific criteria and it's simply up to the researcher who's writing the review to make decisions about what they would like to include. And those studies aren't assessed for the quality of their methodology or their scientific rigor in any way before they are included. And this is different from a systematic review. With a systematic review, we want to evaluate the quality of all the literature that's included. And so we are going to use a very clearly specified procedure as well as possibly established instruments for assessing all papers that we include. And they're all going to be assessed at the same point in time and using the same criteria. And this will include assessment of things that are relevant to the research question that the authors are asking, as well as assessments for risk of bias. So for example, in biomedicine, things like blinding randomization um, was the sample at a low risk of bias and so on and so forth. What this means is that when we get to the conclusions generated by these two types of reviews, the narrative review is subjective or is can be influenced by many different biases because there was no systematic procedure or criteria for deciding what was included or how those things were evaluated and discussed. Systematic reviews can also be at risk of bias, for example, publication bias if negative findings or null results weren't published, whereas positive studies were. And there may also be other forms of bias introduced by the particular protocol that was used. However, overall, the risk of bias is significantly lower. So how do systematic reviews work? Well, again, we have to have these predefined criteria for every step in the process. So we want to start out by writing a protocol. We're then going to perform a literature search to identify all relevant literature, and that needs to include at least two different search engines, as different search engines index different bodies of literature. We would then go through the next three steps using a standard procedure where we have two independent reviewers making the assessment separately at each stage and then comparing the results to identify discrepancies. And then there's a specific procedure for resolving those discrepancies. So all of these next three steps are done by two reviewers. So the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to screen titles and abstracts of papers to identify those that are definitely not relevant and exclude those from our sample. 
Anything that is potentially relevant passes on to full text screening, where we examine the full text of the article. And that the conclusion of that, uh, for all articles that we decide to include, we would then abstract data from those full texts. And this is data that's relevant to the research question the authors have proposed and also information needed to assess the risk of bias. And as a last step, we may perform a meta-analysis where we combine the results of all of the studies to estimate the size and the direction of the effect based on the literature as a whole, as opposed to based on a single study. Whether or not we proceed to a meta-analysis depends on whether it's appropriate for research, the research question, as well as the number and quality of studies that are included. So where does a literature survey fit into this? Because our literature survey is a form of the systematic review, but it has some important differences. So we've already talked about how the goal of a systematic review is to systematically identify and evaluate all research that examines a particular research question. With a literature survey, we are using a similar systematic approach, but we're often doing it in order to determine how common a particular practice is within a set of research publications or other records. So literature surveys will heavily borrow methodologies from systematic reviews in order to systematically evaluate articles, but depending on the research question that's being asked, there may be steps that are different or that aren't required. Let's take a quick look at some of the differences. In the article that I'm going to present today as an example, we will be using journals to pick which articles we include in our study. And this isn't the only way to do it, but it's the way that we used in the article we'll talk about today. This is a bit different from doing a literature search in a standard systematic review where you're using two search engines and you need to go through a lot of testing to make sure that you have appropriate keywords that are identifying all the types of papers on the topic that you are interested in. Um, when you're doing a journal-based search, you may have an additional phase to select particular journals to include in your article. You might only need to use one search engine if all articles in that journal are, or if, if all journals included in your sample are indexed. Um, and it's a much simpler search strategy. In terms of title and abstract screening and full text screening, again, this can be a little bit different if you're using a journal-based search. So the screening criteria are often more straightforward. In the case of our studies, we often will include anything that is an original research article. And we may simply be checking the search results against the journal website to confirm that our search did identify all articles published in those journals. When we're abstracting data for full text, in a normal systematic review, we want both data relevant to the research question and data to assess the risk of bias. With literature surveys, it's much less common that we would want to assess the risk of bias. We want a comprehensive look at all literature that's in our sample, and that includes literature with a high risk of bias as well as literature with a lower risk of bias. So this is another important difference. And then in terms of performing a meta-analysis, this is rarely done with literature surveys because it's typically not relevant to the research or question. And so often we're just calculating how often particular items were reported. And while we'll be talking today about a study that applies these literature survey methods to articles or research papers, it's important to remember you can apply these same methods to other type of records as well. So that may include documents describing policies for journals or funding agencies or institutions, or for example, PhD curriculum requirements. And I'll just leave here as an example of that, a paper that we did where we looked at whether statistical education was required for a PhD in physiology in the top funded or the top NIH funded physiology departments. So the paper that I'm going to use today is this one, um, Beyond Bar and Line Graphs, Time for a New Data Presentation Paradigm. And this is a paper that we published in 2015, and it was looking at the problems with the way that we typically present, present continuous data in physiology studies, as well as solutions and better alternatives for how we can display our data. 
One of the reasons I wanted to do this paper and started working on it is that at the time I was a physiologist studying preeclampsia, which is a common cause of maternal and fetal illness and death. And one of the issues in the field at the time was that while women end up with a similar diagnosis and set of symptoms, they often get there in very different ways. So there are maternal problems and fetal problems and placental problems that can all lead to preeclampsia. And that means that for any woman that we look at, or for any, there are likely multiple pathophysiological processes contributing to the disease that she has. And for any pathophysiological process we look at, we expect it to be perfectly normal in some women with preeclampsia and very abnormal in others. So the field at the time was very focused on thinking about how we can identify subgroups of women who have different um, forms of preeclampsia so that we can match patients with appropriate treatments for their condition. Unfortunately, a lot of data are presented in bar graphs, and if you want to identify subgroups, you need a more informative visualization. So bar graphs of continuous data are what we show when we want to mask heterogeneity, when we want to understand heterogeneity or identify subgroups of, of patients, we need more informative visualizations. And so that was the problem that we sought to address with this paper. Um, we know that when you have a bar graph, many different data distributions can lead to the same set of summary statistics that are shown in that bar graph. And so here you can see in panel A on the left, a bar graph showing means and standard errors. And on the right, you see four different data sets that will give you the same bar graph. One of the first things we notice when we look at these different data sets is that the sample size here is really small for all of these data sets. And so there is a lot of uncertainty and we might want more data to be more confident in our conclusions. But if we look at the small data sets that we have, we see in the first panel, the first dot plot in B, that the second group appears to have higher values than the first group. And this is a small difference and one that we're potentially interested in exploring. In the next case, the outlier, the higher values in the second group appear to be driven by a single value. And this might be a difference that's less exciting to us to explore. In the next data set, we have some suggestion that there may be a bimodal distribution. Now our sample is far too small to determine this and we would need more data points to know for sure. But if we were to see this in a larger sample, we might be concerned that there was some other variable that we hadn't measured that might be explaining these tub groups of patients. So for example, perhaps men have higher values and women have lower values for this particular variable. In that case, that sex or gender effect would be something that we would definitely want to measure and explore in future studies. And in the last case, we have unequal sample size. So the values for the second group are clustered at the high end of the range of the values for the first group. And this could simply be a fact uh, due to underestimating the variability in the sample because we have so few data points in that second group. Important to note here is that you cannot distinguish between these scenarios based on the p-value alone. So there really is no substitute for seeing the data. And so this is the problem that we sought to address. Our main research question for the paper, we wanted to know what types of figures were used to present continuous data in physiology research. And we were particularly interested in bar graphs of continuous data, which conceal information about the sample size and the data distribution, as well as more informative alternatives. And that included docs plots, box plots, and histograms. We were also interested in the sample size because that influences which type of more informative graph is better for your data set. And so we recorded the minimum and maximum sample size for any group shown in a figure. And then we looked at how often continuous data were analyzed via non-parametric test and then presented as mean and standard deviation or mean and standard error. And there were a number of other things that we measured, but I'm just going to focus on those three today. So the methods, this seminar series is all about methods in meta research. So how did we do this? Well, for our sampling frame, the papers that we were evaluating, we started by looking at all original research articles that were published in the top 20 physiology journals between January 1st and March 31st of 2014. 
And these journals were selected from the physiology list for 2012 impact factors in journal citation reports. Impact factors are highly problematic and we don't recommend or endorse using them, but it is a way to help us to clarify that these were reputable journals that we were looking at um, and that we weren't including predatory publishers or other potentially problematic journals. In our next step was to perform journal and article screening. So for every article in our sample, it was screened by two independent reviewers to confirm that it was in fact original research. And we also wanted to confirm that it contained new data and presented continuous data in a figure. And any disagreements about that screening were then resolved by consensus. We then proceeded with data abstraction. So we had, again, two independent reviewers separately abstracted data from each paper. This was done by following a standardized protocol and then results from the two review abstractors were compared to identify discrepancies and those discrepancies were then resolved by consensus. There are several main findings and I'll just discuss these briefly before we go back into the methods of this particular type of study. So the first finding was that almost all papers were using bar and line graphs to present continuous data. So 85% of papers had a bar graph, 63% had a line graph. The more informative types of, of graphs were not very common. So 13% had a dot plot and only 5 to 8% of papers had a box plot or a histogram. And these visualization choices that authors were making made it impossible to critically evaluate the data because the sample sizes and the data distributions were not visible. We also found that the sample sizes were very small. In most cases, they were less than 15 independent observations per group. And in a lot of papers, the smallest, the sample size for the smallest group was fewer than six independent observations per group. Most of the time, um, bar graphs were showing mean and standard error. In about 16% of cases, the error bars were showing standard deviation. So this means that most of the time, the bar graph error bars are telling us about the precision of the mean, not the variability in the data. And we also found that more than half of papers that were using a non-parametric analysis to analyze their continuous data then presented that data as mean and standard error or standard deviation. And this is concerning because we often use non-parametric analyses when the sample size is too small to determine the data distribution, or when we know that the data are not normally distributed and hence mean and standard error or mean and standard deviation are likely to be highly misleading. But this illustrates how automated this process of just presenting your data in a bar graph is. This paper had a number of impacts. Um, it led to policy changes in many different journals. So they instituted policy changes in the years following publications of the article that were designed to encourage authors to replace bar graphs of continuous data with more informative graphs and examples of journals that did this included PLOS Biology, the Journal of Biological Chemistry and Kidney International. It also contributed to launching the Bar Bar Plots Kickstarter campaign, which targeted neuroscience journals to encourage, encourage editors to change their policies around bar graph use. And it is still being used um, in peer reviews by reviewers, editors, and journal staff to request more informative visualizations. And then it's also often used in journal clubs and in courses to teach better visualization practices. Limitations. Every study has limitations, and this study also has quite a few. Um, we only looked at one field, which is the field of physiology, and since then we've done more comprehensive assessments across a larger number of fields and many more papers with automated screen tools. It focused on journals with higher impact factor, which then by extension were also English language journals, and hence it may not be generalizable to journals with lower impact factors with coming from other fields or coming from other language backgrounds. And this was one of our earliest studies, so we did not share the protocol, the data, or the code. At the time we published it, we were not able to publish a meta-research article as original research in PLOS Biology. We actually had to publish this as a perspectives article with our data and results and methods in the supplemental files. Um, and so this is something that's different now, but yeah, our more recent work is much more detailed in terms of having those other materials available. 
And then because it was one of our first studies, the protocol was not as detailed as our more recent studies have been. So for those who want an example to look at of how to do these types of studies, I would encourage you to look at some of our more recent work where you will find more detailed methods and protocol sections available than we were able to do in our first paper. And this is just three examples. All of these have repositories associated with them where you can find much more detailed protocols, often with images and other notes about um, particular challenges for abstracting different items and how to make decisions on complicated cases. So for the next few minutes, I'd like to talk just about some things to look for when you are evaluating a literature survey type systematic review. These papers are becoming more and more common. So what should you look for to know whether this is a robust and rigorous study? I'm going to focus on the three things that I most commonly see done poorly. Um, and hopefully this will help you when you're evaluating these types of studies. So the first thing is whether or not the authors used a systematic sampling frame. The second is whether the sampling frame is appropriate for the research question. And the third point is whether the authors used a clear detailed protocol to abstract data. And in addition to using a clear and detailed protocol, we're looking for evidence that there were two independent trained reviewers evaluating each record in this study and that the authors followed other elements of the PRISMA guidelines that are relevant to literature surveys. So first question, did the authors use a systematic sampling frame to identify their papers to include? So let's compare systematic versus non-systematic approaches here. With a non-systematic approach, what typically happens is that the authors will suggest, select a few journals that they're interested in. So for example, you might see something like, we examine papers published in top journals, Nature, Cell, Science, PNAS, Nature's Neuroscience, or perhaps they did a study of a single journal where they happen to be publishing the paper. Um, Issues with this are that there's no rationale for why these journals were chosen and that there's also a small number of journals. So if anything was to be particularly impacted by journal policies or journal of editorial procedures, then the study may not provide a comprehensive overview of the field or the area that it was designed to look at. With a systematic approach, the authors are using a more systematic strategy to identify what journals and papers they want to include in their study. So for example, in our case, we were examining all original research papers that were published in physiology journals, and we had specific criteria related to the impact factor rankings in terms of which articles we selected. Um, you might also see, for example, random selection of papers out of PubMed and classifications made according to the year of publication or the subject area in which the paper was published would be another systematic approach one could use. Another thing that can be helpful in terms of helping you to evaluate whether a systematic approach was used was to look at the study flowchart. And this is an example from one of our more recent preprints that shows a very comprehensive overview of what sampling frame we used. And so here you see, again, we're looking at top journals, and it was based on the 2019 Journal Citation Reports Impact Factor. Um, you can see what we excluded at each phase of the study and why journals or articles were excluded and how this was adjusted and how we got to our final sample set of article. So a flowchart should report the number of included and excluded observations at each phase of the study, as well as all reasons for exclusion, and that will give you a detailed overview of how systematic the sampling approach was. Next thing, another common problem that I see is that the sampling frame is not appropriate for the research question. So your sampling frame is really closely tied into your research question, and it's often the case that if you make an adjustment to your sampling frame, you also change the research question that you're able to answer. I'll go through a couple of examples to illustrate this. Let's think about two different sampling frames. So in the first case, we identify all randomized controlled trials that were published in the top 25% of cardiovascular disease journals during a one-year period. And then we examine each article to assess whether the authors used blinding and randomization. 
For our second sampling frame, we identify all articles that were deposited in April of 2020 in PubMed Central, and then we examine each of those articles to determine whether blinding and randomization was used. So clearly there's a big difference in between these two sampling frames that affects the way we would interpret results of these studies and what research questions we can really ask. So for sampling frame one, everything in there is going to be a clinical trial. And we know that blinding and randomization is relevant to almost all clinical trials, if not all. Whereas with our second sampling frame, we're looking at all different kinds of original research articles. So there will be some clinical trials, but there will also be observational studies where randomization doesn't apply and many other you know, computational modeling studies and so on and so forth. And so this sample is going to include an unknown number of papers for which blinding and randomization aren't relevant. And that means that it's harder to interpret our data because we don't really know what the denominator should be. So here's a clear difference in how we would interpret or understand this data simply based on the sampling frame that we chose to use. We'll do another example. Here again, we have two different sampling frames, and I'll ask you to just think about how this would affect your conclusions. So in our first case, you identify all articles that were published in the top 25% of journals in neuroscience and biochemistry and published during the same one month period. And then we look at each article to determine whether the authors used bar graphs to display continuous data. In the second sampling frame, we want to examine three journals that recently implemented new policies to discourage authors from using bar graphs to present continuous data. And we want to examine all articles that were published for five years before and five years after the policy change took place. And then we're again going to look at whether um, each article that was published used bar graphs to present continuous data. So here again, there's a clear difference in the question that we're asking based on the sampling frame that we chose. The first, quest, the first sampling frame is allowing us to look at how often bar graphs are used to present continuous data in top neuroscience and biochemistry journals. The second sampling frame is appropriate if we want to look at the impact of journal policy. So if we want to know whether journal policy introduces a change in the proportion of papers that use bar graphs for continuous data, then we want a sampling frame that's based around journals that had policy changes as opposed to one that's based on the literature as a whole. So, as a reminder, your research question determines your sampling frame, and you want to make sure that your sampling frame will give you an unbiased answer to the question that you want to ask, or as unbiased an answer as you can possibly get. Next thing that's important to do is to use a clear and detailed protocol to abstract data. And again, you want to have two trained abstractors that are independently abstracting data for each record. Here's an example of some of the things that you might find in a protocol. And I've included a couple of very simple questions here. You can find more complicated examples in some of our past protocol for more challenging questions. And so we start out with the question, are the blots in the paper presented as smaller crops of a full length blot? And this is from our paper looking at Western blots. And then we have three options. So all, all blots are cropped, some blots are cropped and none are cropped. And we see an example here on the right of a cropped blot versus a full length blot to help our reviewers know what exactly it is that they're looking for. And then there's some notes about qualifications to help people make decisions about common cases that may be challenging to rate. So the notes say we only consider crops in the vertical length um, and that the full range of molecular weight sizes should be visible and we don't consider whether there's a molecular weight marker or a ladder present when we're deciding whether the block is cropped. So we're looking at vertical cropping, not horizontal cropping, and we're not counting the molecular weight marker. Here's another example for molecular weight labels. So we again have our question, do the blots have a molecular weight label with examples showing what those labels look like? And we have the same structure of all blots have this, some blots have a label or no blots have a label. And then we have some clarifications. So the molecular weight label does not need to have kilodalton. So just the number is also sufficient. So if it was 35 here instead of 35 kilodaltons, that be, would be okay. 
And then that if authors are presenting multiple blots with the same protein of interest side by side in a way that's meant to be read as a table, then you would classify it as having all labels. And there's another example of that that I didn't show here, um, but that is visible in the full protocol. Okay, what are some challenges you can expect when doing this type of study? Protocol development is a very challenging phase. You often need to go through your protocol with multiple people and several times to make sure that everything you're being assessed that you're assessing can be done reliably and consistently by all of everyone on your data abstraction team. And changing, adapting, refining your protocols is really important. I've never had a study where we didn't have to drop a question because we just didn't think that we would be able to get good, reliable data from all of our abstractors. So what does the protocol development process look like? You want to start off by drafting your protocol and your data abstraction form and your data dictionary. Once you have all of these three things, you're going to go into a test phase. So you want several members of your abstraction team to independently abstract data for several papers, and then you're going to compare your responses. And you're going to be looking at things like, can you abstract data for all measures and all papers? Are there some papers where options are missing, where you don't have the information you need, um, where you wouldn't know how to answer that question? Did all of your team members get the same answers? Are there systematic differences in the way that they are interpreting that protocol and abstracting data? If there are, and there usually will be with your first protocol, you need to adapt your protocol, clarify, make sure that everyone is being guided towards the same decision. And then is anything missing from your protocol? And are there items in your protocol that people are unable to assess consistently? If people can't assess consistently, then you may want to adapt the question, or if you've adapted it multiple times and you're still not able to consess it consistently, you may need to eliminate it because you simply won't be able to get good data. Once you've done your assessment, you want to clarify and adapt the protocol to improve the consistency and feasibility of the assessments. And then you're going to repeat steps two and three over a series of different sets of articles with you know, doing the abstraction, comparing the results, seeing what you need to clarify in the protocol to get everyone moving in the same direction and abstracting data the same way, um, and then retesting. And you want to do that until you're confident that the entire protocol is feasible, clear, and easy for everyone to follow consistently, and you're going to get good performance with all of your abstractors. Your next expected challenge is in training your abstractors. So you wanna start out by reviewing the protocol with everyone. And this abstraction training phase can be quite long, but it's really important because if everyone isn't doing the same thing, then you won't get good data from your study. So you start off by reviewing the protocol with everyone. Then you're going to abstract data for three to five articles as a group. Um, once you've done that, you've kind of oriented everyone to what the questions are and where they might find different information within the article. You're then going to choose a different set of articles that the group hasn't seen before and have each abstractor abstract data for that set of articles. You'll compare your responses, you'll correct any misconceptions or systematic differences. You may need to clarify the protocol and adapt it if there are things that you're seeing that you didn't pick up in the protocol development phase. And then you're just going to go through steps three and four as many times as it takes until you have reliable performance across all extractors. And it's important to note that people need to meet pre-specified practices performance criteria in order to be able to abstract data. There's a number of ways of setting those and determining those, but we won't get into that today. Okay, those are my main comments. So I'm going to stop there and I think we can stop the recording and then we can have a little bit of discussion and questions if people have things that they are wondering about. But I would like to thank all of you for listening.